here with everyone's favorite medical director, Dr. Alicia Green, and we want to talk today about MediShare and COVID-19. I'm sure most of you know that Dr. Green is a board certified family physician. She served many years in the United States Air Force and we're grateful for her service to our country. And then she brought all of that experience with her to MediShare where she runs the MediShare program for us. So Dr. Green, let's get into it today and talk a little bit more about MediShare and COVID-19. Hi, MediShare community. So happy to join you uh, on this very what second week of May now. Um, I just hope that your families are are doing well. That you're um, you're finding ways to connect. Um, just bringing the Lord into your everyday family routine. Um, and I'm excited to uh, just again continue to update what we're doing here at, uh, with MediShare and and really just to hear your questions or concerns uh, that we can answer and and hopefully uh, you know just provide you some good information. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. Uh, I hope that uh, more people have gotten to join us at this point. I just wanna once again, welcome everyone and say, uh, the purpose of this session today is for us to interact with you. So ask any questions you have. There's no question too big or too small. Uh, I know that Dr. Green is anxious to hear from all of you. And so without further ado, I'd like to open us in prayer and then I'll introduce you Dr. Green, if that's okay with you. Sure. Heavenly Father, we come to you now and just dedicate this next few minutes to the service of your kingdom. Lord, we thank you that your mercies are new every day. And in this very challenging time for many people across the world, there is hope. And we're just so grateful to be part of a platform that is sharing hope today. I ask that you would bless Dr. Green and give her wisdom as she speaks to us and be with all of our members whether they be affected physically or mentally and emotionally, Lord, that they would all feel your peace and joy in these few moments. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So Dr. Green, so for those of you who didn't get to join us last week, Dr. Green is a board certified family physician. She also proudly and honorably served in our United States Air Force for many years. So thank you, Dr. Green, for your service. As a, as a military brat, that's very important to me. And I know that, that that is service and it was sacrifice for you and your family. So we appreciate that. So Dr. Green, I know you have all of that experience in your background and then you brought it all to MediShare and you're the medical director here. So that means you kind of help run our MediShare program. And I know that your team is doing a lot of things to serve our members during this time. So maybe you could tell us about a few things that your team is working on. Yes, thanks so much, Elizabeth. And you know, the timing of this really could not be better because I really want to alert our uh, sharing community that it is the program ballot time. Um, you know, one of the things that attracted me so much to MediShare was the, just this concept that it is our members who ultimately are the decision makers on things that we choose to share in and things that we don't. And so that member ballot has been out for about a week. And I just wanna, you know, encourage everybody to please, you know, pay attention to your emails. Um, we're also sending out um, letters and, and hard copy ballots to those um, members that we may not be able to contact through email. So, you know, be alert to that because again, that is one of the unique features of this program and what makes it a sharing community rather than, you know, just your run of the mill health coverage, you know, that sometimes people talk about. So, you know, your voice is is front and center, loud and clear. Um, one of the, you know, COVID-19 um, impacted items that actually is on your ballot this year is just this expansion of telehealth. And, you know, I couldn't think of a, a better example, you know, what we're doing today. I mean, we have all converted pretty significantly to this online communication piece over the last... Yes you know, eight weeks. And so I just really want to, um, you know, encourage people. So one of the added items we put on the ballot this year, believe it or not, our program previously did not share um, in telehealth visits because a lot of times they were um, emails or things like that and they weren't really face to face. But, you know, this COVID situation has really driven lots and lots of medical practices to have real time face to face medical appointments just you know for the protection of, of uh, folks health and convenience sake. Um, and so that is one of the ballot items that we're asking our members to weigh in on. And so um, I just encourage everybody to, to uh, you know, during this time to engage, give us your feedback, help shape this program. 
Dr. Green, I'm so glad you reminded me of that. I actually am a member of MediShare myself and I got my email ballot this last week and I voted. So you'll be happy. Excellent. I'm also a MediShare member uh, and uh You've just reminded me, I need to make sure that my ballot is, uh, that I'm voting and turning it in. So, um, yes. good call out Please there. do. <laughs> Please do. I didn't mean to call you out, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I, I have to tell you, I, I completely agree with you. It is one of the things that I think is the most significant differences between what MediShare does and what other companies do. You actually have a voice at MediShare and we, we are a community who shares in each other's medical needs, emotional needs. That's why we're here today, right? We're sharing hope with our community. It's so much more than just medical bills. So I, I appreciate you reminding us of that. So uh, Dr. Green, so telehealth, that's something that we are working on. We have used it, I understand. Um, I've actually used it myself as a MediShare member and it's really convenient. Uh, what are some other things that your team is working on now? Or maybe you specifically, I know you've written some blog posts for us. Yeah, so I think, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to do, because I just know, just even being in my my home, home church family, as well as, you know, friends, as the COVID situation has really continued to, you know, be ongoing, there's almost an overwhelming amount of information. So early on there was, you know, everyone was craving more information. Now I would just say there's so much information that it's sometimes hard to, to really discern what's factual, what's conjecture. And so, you know, I, I, I'm trying to give the, the community the blog posts and, and trying to really find those neutral resources to uh, just to guide our members to, you know, those kinds of, of places to kind of get factual information over opinions, because, you know, there are a lot of opinions out there, a lot of conjecture. So just really trying to, uh, you know, help help members and to help guide them. That's fantastic, Dr. Green, and something that I personally appreciate with working with you. And I know that I have that advantage over our members. They don't all get to see you every day and work with you. But something I really appreciate about working with you is you're always the voice of reason and you're incredibly practical. And I love that about you. And I love that about your blog posts. So thank you for sharing that with our members because I know that's important. And in one of your earlier blogs, you talked about the social distancing flattening the curve. Can you, can you, Tell me, are we still seeing the curve flattened or has that changed? So definitely um, we have, right? I mean, I think in, in, in my blog post probably about three to four weeks ago, you know, most regions of the United States have, have hit their, um, their peak and, and we're coming down the other side. So we clearly have flattened the curve. Now, I think one of the challenges that we have over the next few weeks is um, really, everyone is monitoring um, what happens to that curve as we as we enter back out into um, our new normal. Right, we're we're entering, going back out into our communities. We're we're applying a lot of those public health um, recommendations from frequent hand washing, social distancing, face masks, all those things that we can do to try to protect um, us from spreading um, germs to other people, right? And so some of uh, what we're seeing in the media now is really like, well, just a lot of conjecture and wondering, well, now what's going to happen to the curve, right? I mean, we, we've already right. flattened it. We're on the other side as we, as we head out what's going to happen with that. And, you know, I think the thing that I really want our, our members to recognize is it, it's each of us doing our little part that's going to continue to keep that curve flat, right? So, you know, what I tried to mention even in, in my most recent one, and I'm tempted myself, I'll be honest, you know, it's time to go in the grocery store. And I kind of look down at that mask and I think, Oh, that's going to be, uh, you know, I, I have that and my little hand sanitizer in my hand. And I, you know, th that's a decision that I have to volitionally make um, each and every time that I go in there, you know, because I kind of, you start to rationalize, you know, you're like, well, you know, I'm only going to be in there for a minute or, you know, it's not right. going to matter or, um, 
you know, when it comes around uh, to, you know, group settings, right? So currently we're still supposed to be limiting our groups to 10 or less. And, you know, there's, there are things that we each have in our lives that we um, are important to us. You know, I, I just was, was um, observing even in my own church, you know, like how are we getting back into our, our church communities? You know, um, my, uh, my old parish up in North Carolina, I still am friends with a lot of folks there and they actually had an outdoor service where people brought their lawn chairs, those kinds of things. So it's really gonna be our ongoing commitment to those types of, of behaviors, even though it's not what we maybe would prefer um, but it's going to be our ongoing commitment to those that's really going to help to continue to keep that curve low uh, and flat. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Green. And I, something that I've noticed, I also went to Publix recently and, you know, they have the arrows pointing which way to walk in the aisle so that we're not all congregating in aisles. But I noticed that even behind the mask, you can tell when people are smiling and in this time, even if you're wearing a mask or if you're not wearing a mask or if you're wearing gloves or if you're not, we can still smile and be kind to one another. And I noticed that it was encouraging to me, even in publics, to see someone smiling. You can see their eyes behind the mask smiling. And that was just encouraging to me. So I would That's just like right. to encourage everyone. That's mask right. or no mask. That's right. <laughs> right. Doesn't That's hurt right. to smile. Doesn't spread anything. So uh, another thing that I wanted to ask you about is uh, I know that MetaShare has launched a website called Sharing Hope, and it's full of all kinds of information. We have everything from artists to thought leaders. They deal with a variety of issues, everything from faith and family to personal finance to just inspiring stories. And I wanted to just see if you've had the opportunity to watch any of those videos or what you know about it, what you can share with our members about that website. Yeah, so it is um, definitely a new initiative here for us just to try to collate some good um, community information in one location. You know, a lot of times it's spread out and, and difficult to find. So, you know, I just think and I'm hoping that our members will really find it just as the go to place where, the, you know, they can branch out again for those reliable informational stories, as well as, you know, faith based um, guidance as well. You know, I will also highlight um, I feel like we're connecting with our community to some extent. You know, we've got our chaplains and, and we've had some of the highest. Uh, open and engagement rates with um, just some of the, the content there. So, you know, keep giving us good feedback about if we're delivering the information that you need um, and an easy, you know, modality for you to find it and to, um, to access it when you truly do need it. And I'm glad you said that as well, Dr. Green, because you reminded me, we also have Facebook Live prayer services. We have chaplains available to pray and Another unique distinguishing characteristic of MetaShare that you don't see with a lot of other organizations is every time one of our members calls in to ask a question about MetaShare, we pray with them. And I love that part of our story. So I think that's encouraging as well. So if we have members who have questions, if you have questions about your membership or anything about what MetaShare is doing right now and you call in, someone will be there to pray with you. So I think that's always an encouragement. That's right. And don't forget about, um, you know, our app. We have prayer stream on our app, which is, um, you know, another way to engage with our community. So if you haven't downloaded your um, uh, MetaShare app, app, you know, it, both on the, the Apple store as well as the um, uh, Android store, you know, do so. And, um, Make sure you have the most up-to-date version because, you know, I, I actually, again, as again, with my member hat on, I enjoy going there. Um, it's just, again, another way to engage with your fellow members for prayer, support, um, and conversation. So, um, you know, it's kind of one of the original tools that we had. And, uh, and you know, I always enjoy going on there. It's, I, it lifts my spirit up as well. I love this, Dr. Green. Okay, so last week you taught me a term I had never heard before. I want to talk to you about another one this week. I've heard this before, but maybe you can help me understand it a little bit better. On the subject of herd immunity, 
we're hearing a lot about that right now. Can you can you just share with me some thoughts about it? What what it means? What direction yeah, are we headed? For sure. You know, I think when you when you hear the term herd immunity, what it really means is when you're talking about an infection specifically, um, each of us has a, a great immune system. And when we come in contact with an infection, our immune system has, has some work to do. You know, it's got to activate itself and get ready to fight off infection. Um, one of the big key pieces in this pandemic that you'll hear folks talk about is infect infectivity or how infectious is a virus. Um, and there are measures of that. You know, if you're a real deep scientific type, you'll hear the term r naught. Uh, and I talked a little bit about that in my blog this week. But, you know, how, different viruses have different infectivities, right? And, you know, some of them are more easily destroyed by, you know, you've heard already in the, in the, in the you know, in the um, media about, you know, direct sunlight, disinfectants, those types of things. And so there's the infectivity of a virus, and then there's your immune and your immune response. Now, each of us as an individual has, you know, our, our immune response to the virus varies, right? Which we know that so well with COVID. Some people, it's really a very mild infection. And, and I mean, they might not, you know, have a day or two of fever and be, be fine. You know, they recover just almost like any respiratory illness whereas others' immune systems are really challenged by this particular virus. And of course, you know, we see the results of that in the hospitalizations and those types of things. So when we talk about herd immunity, it's really kind of trying to measure our community as a whole, how we uh, are able to fight the virus off at, together, right? Because the virus can only keep infecting new people when it when it encounters people who don't have immunity against it right so right. that's where the concept of herd immunity goes and for some of the less infectious viruses you know not very many of us have to develop immunity before the virus basically runs out of new people to infect right and it kind of then withers and 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 decreases in terms of its impact on us as a, as people whereas um other ones, and, and you know, COVID is not, uh, you know, I even mentioned in my blog, COVID isn't super infectious, right? Measles, believe it or not, is the most infectious virus that we have. Um, wow. For every one person who gets measles, um, they transmit it to on an average of nine to 12 other people. So it's wow. pretty infectious. And if you look at COVID, it's sitting somewhere around two to three, right? So for every wow. one person who's infected, they pass that on to two or three other people. So that's kind of a measure of the infectiousness of the of COVID. And all what we're really saying is, because it's not as infectious as measles, um, not as many people in the in the community need to be uh, have immunity to stop the spread. So for example, my measles example, you would have to have a 94 or 95% of, of people to have antibodies to stop the spread. For COVID, the estimates are somewhere around 70%. So, you know, when folks kind of, you know, I'm always a, how long is this gonna last kind of a person, you know, <laughs> how much more, how much longer? So when you talk about measuring antibodies in the community, that's really what people are focused on is, you know, how much immunity is out there? You know, how many of us have encountered the virus Develop the antibodies, and now we're we have some protection against becoming infected. And um, and again, some of the estimates, and it varies. Uh, we're still learning every day, you know. So we we have to be a little flexible on that. But uh, we we believe that once about seventy percent of us develop immunity to COVID, that the spread will slow and and stop. Well, the germaphobe inside me is very happy that I carry hand sanitizer with me everywhere and I have for a very long time. But that just reinforced that I wanna carry it even more. <laughs> Anytime <laughs> I go anywhere, there will be lots of hand sanitizer. So, okay, well, thank you for sharing that with me. And what was the word you used? Uh, the r not. Yes, I need to write that down. Every week I learn a new medical term from you. That's right, r little zero. It's just a okay. measure of an infectiousness of a virus. Excellent. Well, that's my trivia word for today. So I appreciate you sharing that with me. No problem. 
while we're waiting on additional questions, I wanted to go back to the Sharing Hope website because I, I don't think I, I talked about this earlier and I just wanna make sure that our members who are listening hear that we're putting new videos up, I think daily or every couple of days. So this week we have new videos from Rebecca St. James, um, Sherry Lynn, Colton Dixon, Bart Millard, if you know who he is. Um, I don't know if you saw the movie. Um, I can only imagine. Did you see that, Dr. Green? I haven't, but it's on my uh, it's on my list. Of, you'd think with all of this uh, home stay at home stuff, I, I would have <laughs> caught up on some of my movies that I wanted to see. But um, so, can changing. you give us a preview? Is it is it? Uh, uh, it's, it's a good work. Wow. Life changing movie. Life changing. I'm not a I'm not a sappy movie person. I don't like to cry in the movies. This is not my thing. I cried the entire movie, but it was just amazing. Just hearing that story, and it's it's a it's a sharing hope kind of story, and so that's why I, I brought that up because he's his story is just amazing. You have to watch it. So, well, I maybe. will I will put that on my watch list this weekend. And you know, Elizabeth, it kind of just really highlights something else that you know I I think in one of my blogs I, I commented about taking care of yourself and. And, you know, I think um, in this day and age with so much information coming at everybody, you know, you get to make a choice every day of the kind of um, stories and information that you're going to surround yourself with. And so, you know, finding those outlets of, of good, um, good, yes. good information and, and good positive feelings um, can really be helpful during this time. So, you know, sometimes I, I often will share again with my family and friends that, you know, sometimes turning off all the, the, the data, right, which sometimes can, can stoke anxiety and, and some of those other things, you know, as they talk about, you know, the, the, the virus, the economy, mm -hmm. you know, all of those kinds of things It can really churn a lot of anxiety. So, Definitely yes. good exercise. I, I always encourage that. Um, as a physician, I used to tell my patients, you know, um, your body only knows one way to deal with stress, and that's it pumps out adrenaline. Um, and so that really can cause you to have, you know, physical symptoms that, that make you feel unwell. So making sure you have physical exercise as a part of your, your, um, your lifestyle and your plan is super helpful. Um, because that adrenaline, your body needs to use it, right? I mean, right. it needs to burn that off so that, you know, it stays well and healthy. And then also making sure that you nurture your your spiritual, your mental, and your social um, your social portions of your, of your whole being, your whole self. So making sure that you reach out to, uh, you know, your family and friends via Zoom. I mean, I'm sure all of us never thought we would be having family Zoom meetings, but those types of things, right. connecting with each other um, is super helpful. And just, again, keeping yourself physically, mentally, and emotionally and spiritually strong. Those all are key factors as we navigate through the next several months. I, I love that, Dr. Green. Thank you for sharing. And it encouraged me, I need to go out and walk tonight. So I'll be That's doing that, right. don't worry, when we get done, <laughs> put on my walking shoes and go. I, I will say that's been something that I have found very encouraging during this time is I see more and more people out walking and riding bikes. And, you know, when I would walk in the evenings or sometimes in the mornings, you might see a handful of people three months ago or four months ago. But now I see many, many people outside. So I think that could be a real positive that comes from a really tough situation because I even heard, I don't, I don't know if you want to comment on this or not, but I even heard something about uh, people saying that vitamin D levels could be low because people are staying inside. I'm not sure that's true in Florida. I think a lot of us are outside walking around. Well, I have, I actually have a little medical data for you on that, Elizabeth. Uh -huh. So do you know to make enough vitamin D for yourself, you only need to expose one square centimeter of skin for uh, 30 to 60 minutes per day. So, um, you know, it doesn't take much sunlight necessarily for your body to make enough vitamin D. So plus we fortify it in our milk and those other types of uh, enrichments. So, um, you know, I think... 
uh, there's just always a lot of media searching for content to fill up some of their <laughs> some of their airtime. Right. Right. So, doesn't take much. And the uh, super Irish Scottish pale skin inside me was thrilled that you said it only takes 30 to 60 minutes because we we can't be outside for very long without sunscreen on. That's right. Or uh, vitamin D fortified milk or vitamin D fortified orange juice. All of those things uh, can help keep your vitamin D levels up. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I will do that. Dr. Green, you are just always a wealth of information, but again, the way you deliver it is so practical and I really appreciate you spending your time with us today. Um, I, oh, sorry, I lost my sound for a minute. I, I appreciate you spending your time with us. I know that there's a lot of, a lot of information coming at all of us right now about whether we should be inside, whether we shouldn't, whether this is an overreaction or it's an underreaction or the right reaction. And so I just thought maybe if you could tell us briefly what you personally are doing. I, I, I figure you're wearing masks when you go to the supermarket, still social distancing yourself. Yeah, you know, I think for each person, you are in your own unique situation. And I do think, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be... I'm just going to be truthful. You know, in my mind, I always think, well, what's my immune system going to do if I come up against uh, the virus, right? So what I can do is, you know, there's things that I can control. There's things I can't control. So I don't know how, how it, my immune system is going to react. I think we're all prayerful and hopeful that, you know, we'll be one of the lucky 80% that really it's just like a cold. Um, so I just think if you as an individual or somebody who's got a chronic illness, you know, have underlying heart problems, underlying lung problems, you probably should be um, a little extra careful, right, in terms of this, the decisions you make, the places you choose to go, how frequently and how often you expose yourself to those, um, you know, those are going to be personal and private decisions. I would tell you as somebody who's worked in the medical environment for a long time, you know, I, I've been exposed to lots of dangerous viruses over time. I mean, we've had, you know, people with active tuberculosis, which is a bacterial infection come in. We've had, um, you know, lots and lots of H1N1 flu. I mean, we've had other types of, of viruses that have had a big impact on our, our public health. Um, but, um, you know, I just try to apply those, those public health measures. And I know it seems simple, but again, just hand washing, making sure that, you know, um, I think we, a few years ago, I'm going to say five to seven years ago, you know, when, when I was a child, right, we used to always just kind of cover our face when we see it. Well, we don't do that right. anymore because that's right. not a good idea, right? So we're now doing, you know, this. To, the vampire. You know, just, those kind of things. The face mask is really just taking this to the next level, right? It's there all the time when you're out in public. So, you know, you're doing your part to help protect really other people from, from you and, and, and spreading that virus should you be exposed. So I think those are really the key, the key pieces. It's going to be individualized and you're going to have to assess uh, your your personal decisions about what's important for your family. You know, maybe you need to be going to work because it's important. I mean, you you also, you know, you have obligations and support right. there. On a, on the other hand, if you're one uh, someone with a chronic infection or chronic illness, and you can make different choices. You know, if you're retired or whatever, maybe it, during this particular time over the next months uh, as that herd immunity continues to develop in, in the community, maybe you stay home a little bit more than you otherwise would.